So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, today we're uh, having an exciting uh, presentation on uh, some really cool expansion plans proposed by Amtrak. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about who we are for those just joining us. Um, and then uh, we'll have the presentation and some time for questions and answers. And if you could put uh, the uh, questions as we go in the Q&A box or in the chat box, um, we'll look at those as we go. Um, I want to thank our sponsor, uh, A5 Branding and Digital. Uh, they've been helpful to us in the past with helping to communicate and uh, run some really exciting conferences around uh, uh, environmental issues. Um, for a little bit of background on us, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We strive to be the most knowledgeable independent source of what high-speed rail is, why we should build it, and what steps that folks can take um, in state capitals and at the federal capital and with private companies uh, to make it happen. And then we give you the tools you need in order to educate um, your leaders in your state capital and in Washington, DC. We believe in what we call the integrated network approach where high-speed lines, uh, new lines built for uh, trains going 220 miles an hour plus or minus uh, connect major cities. Existing lines are put into public ownership in some cases in order to be focused on passenger rail, um, either on places like the Chicago to Detroit corridor or the Caltrain corridor in, in uh, Northern California. Um, and then the majority of route miles are going to be on privately owned uh, railroads uh, with the infrastructure built to allow frequent trains at 80 miles an hour um, over to create a much broader. And in some cases, the trains will go on each type of track in one journey. And sometimes uh, you'll switch between trains and buses in order to complete your journey. Um, our goals are a big federal program with uh, somebody getting, everybody getting something different, but, but something for everybody in at least 49 states, including improving the Alaska Railroad. Um, you know, we have interstate highways in, in Honolulu or in uh, Hawaii and Puerto Rico. Maybe we have a rail program for them as well, but at least 49 states. We need to be very optimistic. We need to plan for success. We need to both do long-term planning now, get some big transformative projects underway while getting a lot more trains running on the existing network as fast as possible. Um, and we believe that we've got to get to a point where railroads make money at this the same way that highway contractors make money building highways um, and defense contractors make money building weapons. Um, so that's what we're about. If you like uh, what you see today, if you like the work we're doing, uh, please join us. Um, and I'm, our website is hsrail.org. And if you go to the uh, Get Involved and get some uh, swag page, you can get a, a t shirt or a hat, et cetera. Uh, but I want to thank Derek uh, for joining us. And why did this not? There we go because I hit the wrong button in the panic. Uh, I want to introduce Derek with the Government Affairs Department of Amtrak. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. We first met when we were trying to get Amtrak to allow bikes on trains. And um, I remember the first launch of that, a group of us actually went down um, and took the train from St. Louis to Herman and rode back to St. Louis. And thank you, Derek, for making your role and making that trip possible. Um, but uh, we've got an exciting program to talk about with Amtrak today. And Derek, I'll let you take it away. Oh, thank you very much, Rick. I hope everybody can hear me. Can you hear me okay, Rick? All right, Rick. Also, I'll need you to allow me to share my screen too. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, as Rick said, Derek James, uh, I take care of government affairs for Amtrak uh, in the Midwest. Uh, and these have been very exciting times uh, for us at Amtrak. Uh, we've been making a bit of news, I think, uh, is probably one of the reasons that um, uh, we have, um, uh, that Rick has had such a great uptake uh, with uh, attendance today. 
Uh, so uh, I'd kind of like to talk about uh, where we are at Amtrak right now uh, with regard to uh, our expansion plans and how I think they fit extremely well uh, with the uh, integrated approach that uh, Rick talked about. Uh, so uh, just again, a quick 101. I'm assuming that everybody on this call uh, is pretty familiar with us here at Amtrak. Uh, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary uh, as a federally chartered corporation operating the nation's passenger train system. Uh, our uh, our vision, our charge is to provide an effective inner city uh, mobility, uh, an inner city passenger rail system uh, for the nation that is uh, trip time competitive. Uh, and pre pandemic, uh, we operated over a 21,000 uh, mile route network uh, with about 300 daily trains uh, serving uh, most of the major cities in the United States, although not always well. Uh, so uh, from the beginning, uh, I think uh, it's instructive to sort of go back to the beginning for just a moment to give us some context on where we are today. Uh, what you have right there before you is, as part of Amtrak's founding, the US DOT actually set up the route network for Amtrak. Uh, the private sector railroads had run a slightly more extensive network, although it was basically collapsing uh, uh, because of various reasons, competition from other modes, uh, not really attending to the needs of travelers and how those uh, travel markets were changing. So this is the route network that the US DOT set up for Amtrak. Uh, it was a slim down network uh, of about uh, 16, 15, 16,000 miles uh, with about 150 trains a day. This is the network today. Uh, you'll notice that it looks very familiar. Uh, during most of Amtrak's existence, uh, much of our effort was uh, just survival uh, and reversing the slide and the decline in the passenger rail network. Uh, noted, though, is that we are still carrying about uh, twice as many folks as we were at the beginning, despite the uh, route network looking very similar. Uh, at the beginning of the first full year of Amtrak, we carried 16 million people. Uh, in the last pre-pandemic year, we carried more than 32 million customers on this network. Uh, and a lot of that growth, though, has come from the type of corridors that we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, this map here, many of you may have seen this. Uh, our signature long distance routes are the ones that are uh, highlighted there in yellow. Uh, the red uh, corridor over to the right is our Northeast Corridor, where we actually run the right of way. Uh, it's one of the busiest, that is the busiest electrified, busiest stretch of railroad in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but what's really noteworthy and I think instructive for us going forward is those blue lines. The blue routes are routes that we operate in conjunction with state governments. And usually those are corridors uh, of less than uh, 500 miles or so, where we can operate, we operate several trains a day, uh, and the states cover some of the capital costs and they cover the uh, operating losses that may be necessary on those services. That's really where the growth has been in passenger rail uh, in the US. Uh, about half of our customers every day travel on those segments that are highlighted there in blue. So remember that going forward. So again, uh, looking back to where we were in 1971, the US has changed a lot. Uh, the population uh, has uh, increased by well more than a third uh, in the 50 years since Amtrak's existence. And the population of the US is moving. Uh, the US at the time of our founding, uh, we had 49 million people living in the Northeastern United States, 35 million in the West and 63 million in the South. Uh, we see that uh, the, the US population has grown uh, but the uh, population has shifted. Uh, the uh, route network uh, that Amtrak covered back in 1971 does not really meet the needs of the United States of today, much less the United States 30 years from now. Uh, here is a map uh, of the uh, nation uh, that some of you may have seen. Uh, despite uh, being a country, a broad, covering a broad geographic area, we still, and we are concentrating into what uh, we like to refer to as mega regions. Uh, oftentimes we get um, opposition to investments in passenger rail, say the U.S. is too large, who's going to take a train from Chicago to Los Angeles? Well, we know that uh, the sweet spot for passenger rail is really uh, in those corridors of 100 to uh, 400, 500 miles, and that's where the U.S., and that's where the American public is settling. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, we, uh, I'm from Chicago, so I'm familiar with the Great Lakes region. It's the territory which I cover for Amtrak. Uh, but again, uh, looking at uh, Florida, the Gulf Coast, the Texas Triangle, uh, the Piedmont area, and on the West Coast, 
uh, lots of population movement. Uh, again, the Northeast Corridor is still a very critical high population area, but the U.S. is spreading out to more of these mega regions. Uh, this map here superimposes the existing Amtrak network over the mega regions of, uh, of where the uh, United States is growing and where folks are moving to. I think, again, what's instructive, the darker the line is where there's more robust Amtrak service. The dashed lines are our long distance routes, which are normally just once a day service. Uh, we've got significant uh, population based population centers in the United States that really don't have the quality or the type of Amtrak service that would lend towards people using it on a regular basis. Atlanta, say, for instance, uh, one of the top 10 metro areas in the country uh, has one long distance train a day that passes through it. Texas, uh, you know, our, I think, what, second or third most populous state in the United States uh, only has uh, three Amtrak routes, uh, one of which is a corridor service. The other two are long distance services, uh, some, again, passing through in the wee hours of the night, not really providing the level of service that uh, we think uh, those taxpayers deserve. Uh, here's a representation uh, of, again, the differences in service uh, that exist across the network. The Northeast Corridor, again, uh, where we actually own the route, uh, 60 million persons living there, a uh, lot more daily frequency, a lot more uptake in Amtrak service. Uh, there's a railroad culture that exists in that uh, part of the country because of the level of service that we've been able to provide. Uh, so at Amtrak, we think the way to fix this uh, is to provide more service in the population, in the places where Americans live, uh, developing more intra-regional service, uh, connecting the communities within those mega regions, which you saw on the previous map. Uh, we need to look at how do we go big? How do we grow Amtrak service so that it serves more of the US population? Uh, we all know this. We think investments in passenger rail make a lot of sense. Uh, we think that passenger rail investment uh, allows for more sustainable travel. Uh, it increases mobility for all sorts of populations, and we think it provides economic value, not only to the nation as a whole, but to the, to the communities in which we hope to provide service to. Uh, all sorts of sustainability uh, pluses for passenger rail. Passenger rail is way more efficient uh, than other modes, uh, both air uh, and uh, travel by personal automobile. Uh, we think that um, we know that passenger rail uh, trips uh, emit less, much less emissions into the environment uh, than those other modes. Uh, and we see uh, the coming demographics have a preference and they will move, they will change their travel habits to shift to modes that are sustainable uh, if those travel modes are actually there and present for them to use. Uh, we think mobility is important. Uh, I have a map that I'll show you shortly. Uh, which uh, provides a graphic representation of traffic congestion uh, and how the traffic congestion in these mega regions is really, really untenable. And passenger rail uh, has a mode, has a, has a role, we think, uh, to play in providing people with travel options. Uh, the country is urbanizing again, uh, so passenger rail uh, can uh, play a role in providing that. Uh, here again uh, is an estimation in 2045 of where we will see uh, peak uh, travel on the interstate system where the congestion will be such that um, uh, travel by car will become more and more unpleasant. So folks will be looking for an alternative mode. And you can see the, the thickness of the red lines really coincides with those mega regions and where the population uh, is living uh, in 2045. So again, uh, rail can play a role there. Uh, we think there's a business case to be made for passenger rail. Uh, we think that passenger rail is part of a larger network, again, of possible future high speed lines, uh, of uh, better transit service, of connection to bike share. Uh, our vision that we're going to put forward will have connections to, the, to air travel. Uh, this is a, not about modes competing with one another, but this is about each mode bringing to the table uh, what it does best uh, in providing sort of seamless travel options uh, in, within regions uh, throughout the country. Uh, we think that uh, uh, rail, uh, again, uh, the economic benefits will uh, accrue to not only large cities that are the anchors of the, of the corridors we'd like to provide, but also provide economic benefits to the smaller intermediate communities uh, that uh, have seen, have lost out as the air system 
uh, as airlines have pulled out of smaller markets and as intercity bus carriers have pulled out as well. Uh, and as always, um, uh, we're, I'm, I'm, proud, I'm glad to say that rail jobs, uh, both the jobs that are direct support, directly supported and those ancillary jobs uh, in construction are, are well-paying jobs. Uh, we know that this works. Uh, we've seen examples of it. Uh, this sort of incremental development that we would like to see uh, in passenger rail. Uh, the state of Virginia is a state that um, we are working with to advance an, ex uh, an aggressive expansion uh, that includes growing uh, the base service, which the state of Virginia already had uh, with several frequencies a day, uh, connecting the Northeast Corridor with Richmond, uh, with uh, the uh, Tidewater region of Newport News and Norfolk, uh, and with Roanoke. Uh, we're working with the state to acquire uh, additional uh, capacity on the host railroad network uh, so that we can begin to increase frequencies. Uh, and these improvements build upon previous improvements. As uh, existing riders travel more, as the service becomes more convenient, uh, as we expand to uh, include service to additional cities, like expansions from Roanoke over to uh, Blacksburg and Christianburg, uh, the state of Virginia is even looking at a route that crosses the state and doesn't even connect uh, to the Northeast Corridor directly uh, because they see rail as a way to really transform the state and improve mobility across the state. And that's what we want to do across the country. Uh, part of the reason that uh, we're making news at Amtrak is because uh, we, are, we have put forward our proposal to the Congress, and we're airing this in the public, our proposal to reauthorize the surface transportation bill, which expires in the fall, uh, expires at the end of this fiscal year. And part of our reauthorization proposal is to make some changes to that legislation that will allow Amtrak to put forward an aggressive vision of growing corridors. Uh, we think that the, that the time to do this is now, uh, that the successes that we have Am at Amtrak have demonstrated in growing our ridership on our existing network, on reducing our operating losses, uh, has given us a level of bipartisan support, which we think would support our vision for growth. Uh, we think that the nation uh, coming out of this pandemic uh, is well positioned to make some investments in our infrastructure uh, that would ready the country uh, for, for the nation of the future. Uh, a nation that is addressing its climate needs, a nation that is becoming more urban, uh, a nation that is becoming more diverse. Uh, so we are in our reauthorization proposal, which we submitted to Congress, uh, seeks $59 billion uh, for various things, including the corridor expansion program, uh, including reinvestments in the fleet, uh, including uh, investments in our infrastructure. Uh, the, there's a large backlog of need uh, on the, in the assets that we own, uh, at Chicago Union Station, where I am, along the Northeast Corridor, uh, and really uh, to invest in the host railroad network as well to be able to deliver a level of service that we think the country can support. Uh, that reauthorization plan, again, is seeking multi-year funding uh, for passenger rail, reliable funding so that we can make these investments, so that we can make the long-term investments uh, to uh, grow the system. Uh, we think that a passenger rail trust fund uh, makes a lot of sense uh, so that we can uh, really plan going forward and not make investments on a year-to-year on -year basis. Uh, we think that the re our reauthorization proposal will strengthen our relationship uh, with the federal planners, uh, with the state governments, uh, and again, allow for uh, investments in the system uh, to make passenger rail the preferred mode of transportation in corridors between 100 and 400 miles. Uh, we want to seek an update to the Section 209 policy, which governs our relationships with the state. Uh, the states are in with us on that, on making changes uh, that will make our accounting uh, more transparent and share the costs in a way uh, that we think are fair. And the backbone of our system is really the long distance network. And so we're seeking improvements to that, to that network as well, including investments in new rolling stock uh, to, so that, we, that that network can continue to service for 50 years going forward. Uh, we know that uh, the problem that we've had, again, is that we have not seen the level of a federal investment that go to other modes, and our bold vision, we think, starts to begin to correct that. Uh, so that vision, again, uh, it's about a corridor development plan uh, that uh, really takes advantage of the sweet spot of passenger rail, those 100 to 500 mile corridors uh, that uh, deliver a low carbon mobility uh, for the nation. 
here's the list of the routes that we would like to see uh, added to the Amtrak network. Over the next 15 years, uh, we expect to, we would like to add uh, almost uh, 40 uh, new corridor routes and make improvements to 25 existing corridor routes. Uh, take a look there. Uh, you will see uh, many of the corridors or most of these are within the mega regions that I identified on the previous map. Uh, it has been exciting over the past couple of months or so to begin to have conversations uh, with local officials uh, in places like uh, Columbus, Ohio, Crestline, uh, Cincinnati, Duluth, Minnesota, Iowa City. Uh, folks, the, the response has been almost universally positive. Americans want more passenger trains. Uh, here's a network map uh, that shows not only our existing corridors in black, uh, the yellow lines uh, represent the enhancements to the existing corridors that we have, and the blue lines represent new routes, places that we would like to add to our network. Uh, like I said, in our last pre-pandemic year, we carried more than 32 million customers. We think that in the next 15 years, by the addition of these routes, we will add 20 million more passengers annually to the Amtrak network, making us a more relevant travel mode for uh, consumers all over the country who today do not have rail as a reliable mode for them. So at that, uh, we will certainly, uh, we've again presented this to the Congress. Uh, we have been having conversations with our state governments and with communities around the country. Uh, in order to implement this, we will need your support. Uh, we will need you to let uh, your congressional, your representatives uh, in the Congress know, and to an extent in your state houses as well, know that Amtrak has a bold vision, which we, that you think is worthwhile to provide relevant quality passenger rail service to the country. Uh, again, I know I'm speaking with the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, this is not a purely high speed rail expansion. This would be an expansion of conventional rail service. Uh, not, uh, there will be segments of the network that uh, will operate at higher speeds. We believe in an incremental development approach uh, and that uh, by developing this system, it makes development of true high speed services even more plausible uh, to build upon this network. Uh, at that, Rick, I will turn it back over to you. And if there are any questions for folks, I will do my best to try and answer them. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so there are many, many questions and, and chats. So it is very clear that we're not going to get to them all. But I apologize for that. But we will do our best. Um, I've seen this come up with a couple of times. Um, uh, uh, Louisville to Nashville. So if, if you look at Milwaukee, Chicago, Indianapolis, Louisville, Nashville, Chattanooga, Atlanta, Savannah, Jacksonville, Orlando, you've got a bunch of small city pairs there that could be connected in really exciting ways. Mm -hmm. How was this network determined and how, how, did, how was it decided whether or not places like those links between Louisville and Nashville would be on? Well, over the past couple of years, uh, we have been looking at uh, travel demand, uh, movement of persons between uh, different markets, uh, as well as looking at the existing railroad network, uh, where we and we try what we try to do is match uh, reasonable investments that could be made on the railroad network with corridors that have high demand. Uh, so uh, the the network that you see here represents corridors that we think would perform well, meaning have a high level of ridership. Uh, we would be able to implement at reasonable cost improvements in the host railroad network to be able to accommodate a level of frequency that would drive high ridership uh, and in turn provide us with a level of revenue that would keep the operating support low. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of, uh, any, any of you who know the nation's railroad network know that there's a lot more railroad track out there in the US than we run on with Amtrak or that we're even providing expansion. But all of those corridors, we don't think would deliver the level of ridership and revenue uh, that would keep this a reasonable cost, uh, long-term prospect for the nation. Remember, we have to, the way the uh, passenger rail authorization exists, uh, we are, 
what we're proposing is that we cover the cost initially for the upstart and for any operating support, but then eventually we would need to partner with the states to maintain these routes. So we, what we want to present to them are corridors that we think would perform well financially and not be a long-term burden on the state in terms of operating support. So we should be clear, what does Congress need to do to make this map a reality? Congress needs to either approve President Biden's uh, American Rescue Plan, which in, its, in his proposal provides uh, $80 billion uh, to passenger rail, or approve our uh, legislative and grant request uh, where we lay out and seek, um, uh, seek the funds necessary to implement this plan. So uh, the president's plan is a little bit more front loaded. Ours is spread out over time. Uh, because it takes time to sort of ramp these route, route, routes up. So, so yeah, we, we want folks to basically contact their congressman and say, Amtrak has a bold plan, please support it. Uh, we are certainly having conversations with uh, representatives across the nation. So if they're not familiar, they will be soon. Excellent. Um, uh, can, uh, sorry, continuing in that it takes a while to ramp up. How much environmental clearance work is going to be needed and how much of it has been done? Yeah, again, uh, some of these corridors uh, are already advancing and that work has been done. Uh, say for instance, uh, the Twin Cities to Duluth, uh, they've already received a Fonzie. Uh, Chicago to the Twin Cities, uh, we're in the last uh, months uh, of, of finishing the environmental clearance work. Uh, so uh, different routes are in different phases of planning. Uh, this network map, that map that we've put out in many instances, it has been uh, a discussion that we have had with states and so it aligns with the uh, state's rail plans. Uh, so, the, uh, so some of that work has been done, uh, others of it will need to get started. So that's why it's uh, really a 25, a 15 year plan for us, so. So we need to figure out how to get the environmental studies moving forward mm -hmm. quickly. Yes. Um, going back, I had a number of people um, over the last week ask about Fort Wayne. How, how do people that aren't on this network help get themselves on this network? I may not have stressed this, but in our reauthorization proposal, in addition to the dollars that we're seeking to implement the Amtrak plan, the Amtrak vision, we also stress and we also want the existing uh, federal grant programs like RAISE, like the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Program to be provided dollars so that states can continue to move forward with their own priorities. Again, some states manage their passenger rail programs as a public service. Others want us to manage it for them so that we minimize taxpayer support. Uh, for those states that uh, have uh, public service priorities to connect communities to one another uh, that may not score as well from a financial perspective, uh, we want those states to still have funds available to them so that they can uh, develop those corridors that might not be on their map. And so that's how you maybe deal with a, or address the needs of say a Chicago, Fort Wayne, Columbus, or Louisville and Nashville that may not be connected on this map. Uh, we want those states to have the resources to be able to go ahead and advance those projects too. So then that same vein, you know, one of the, there's two critical infrastructure projects in the center, uh, Union Station mm -hmm. uh, and the South of the Lake Reroute, which are kind of related, but kind of separate. Mm -hmm. how, how does this proposal deal with the issues around the, the real need for new tracks in Northern Indiana? The, to be honest, a high, a, I wouldn't say the bulk, but a lot of the dollars that we're seeking are really dollars that are going to be invested in the existing freight railroad network to be able to accommodate the additional passenger trains that we'd like to see. Uh, so not to zero on any one corridor, but one of the things that we're seeking in the reauthorization is that the Surface Transportation Board be given the tools that it needs and we can set some timeframes in terms of uh, addressing access for Amtrak to the host railroad network in a timely manner for new services. And that includes resolving 
issues about how much investment is needed to be able to accommodate passenger trains. So in the case of the South of the Lake reroute, that could be uh, addressing capacity needs on the existing freight railroad, or it could be rerouting to another railroad and investing in capacity on that railroad. Uh, so again, a lot of this, some of the specifics are not there yet because this is really kind of a broad vision that we want to get buy into. Some of those details are going to have to come later, but know that we have thought about that. And then can, uh, can you give us an update on what is happening with the, the platform and concourse issues at Union Station? Uh, we, uh, for those of you who are not from the region, uh, Amtrak, the city of Chicago, the RTA have developed a Chicago a Union Station master plan, uh, which has looked at uh, future growth and the capacity enhancements that will be needed at Union Station, uh, not only for train side growth, but also for pedestrian uh, flow within the station itself. Uh, we are seeking funds within the our reauthorization proposal uh, to enact pieces of that master plan. Uh, so we are looking to widen platforms, add additional egress, uh, make changes within the passenger concourse to improve passenger flow and safety. So we are seeking those dollars uh, in the master plan. I think the city of Chicago and we have on, may have on our website aspects of the master plan if folks want to take a look at what we're calling for. Okay, and then we also have a website on that, fixunionstation.com. I won't say that there are some great, I will say that there are some great ideas that the High Speed Rail Association uh, has had. I'm not saying that's where we got them from, but there is some overlap. <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, talking about overlap, uh, Dallas, Houston, Orlando, Tampa, uh, Miami, uh, Las Vegas to Los Angeles. Uh, uh, Orlando, Tampa to Miami's under, well, I'm sorry, Orlando to Miami's under construction, Tampa mm -hmm. they're negotiating. Uh, Texas Central is moving forward, we hope. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it sounds like Las Vegas, Brightline's going to go to construction for Las Vegas. How does this map interact with those services? Well, I would, I think, well, don't we as consumers want to have a robust a competitive passenger rail environment, just like we do on the air side. Uh, I will say that um, right now, the only entity that's running passenger trains uh, between uh, right now is, is Amtrak. Uh, we, we are fully in support of development of, uh, of those additional corridors. We think those services, um, you know, sometimes there's overlap, sometimes there are synergies. Uh, Texas Central, for instance, we've struck a deal with them uh, so that uh, we will they will we will handle the ticketing for them. Uh, so yeah, so we've got a line here on the map for Dallas to Houston. Uh, could be them, could be us, but I'll tell you, we'll be selling the tickets for that particular corridor. Okay. Um, there was some stuff in the uh, testimony about ticketing arrangements with Brightline in Florida. Maybe that's outside of your range, but uh, what would it take to do ticketing, joint ticketing there? You know, I, I'm going to have to say you've stumped me on that one. I actually was not aware uh on uh with the with the bright line i mean again like we've struck a deal with texas central uh if uh bright line is open and there's some synergies there uh in the florida corridor uh, i think we're open to uh discussions with them uh we've looked at them we think they bring some great ideas to the table so and that's that's the great thing about having a, com a competitive uh passenger rail environment is that we all we all force the, one another to do better so. absolutely Mm -hmm. You know, there was that issue in Europe, the national railroads got support to keep running during COVID and the private railroads didn't. Um, and, and that's one of the challenges of having a publicly owned railroad versus a privately owned in a, a crisis. It's a different kind of situation. Um, interestingly enough, the Eurostar between Paris and and London was counted as a private railroad, even though it's it's owned by indirectly by public railroads. Um, uh, let's get to frequency. So California has demonstrated that as the frequency goes up, the ridership goes up more. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what level of frequencies are proposed for these routes and how is that determined? Well, uh, there it's, the frequencies vary uh, depending on the corridor. And I'll go back to the, uh, my previous answer that we looked at the travel markets today and what we think could be supported uh, on the existing host railroad network and with the market demand, the travel demand, say along a particular corridor. Now, that's not to, be, not to say that any particular frequency that we're calling for is the end goal. This is really the beginning. Uh, and as we have seen elsewhere, uh, once you pro provide the service and you begin to build the market for rail, you can start to build up and add additional frequencies. I mean, I was around when uh, San Jose to Sacramento was started with three round trips a day. Uh, now, what are they at? 18 round trips a day. Uh, so again, uh, you build it, you provide a high level of service. Uh, so you're looking for some examples. I'll stick to the Midwest because that's what I know. Uh, let's say Chicago, let's say Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati. I've been spending a lot of time in Ohio. We're looking at starting that up with three round trips a day. Uh, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, uh, new corridor. Again, three round trips a day, a pattern where there's a morning, afternoon, and evening departure each way. Uh, Chicago, Louisville, Chicago, Indianapolis to Cincinnati, we're looking at four round trips a day. Uh, Chicago, Carbondale, adding an additional, so you get four round trips a day. Uh, so it varies. Uh, let's say the front range corridor, we're looking at three round trips a day there. So uh, again, I'm focused on the Midwest, so that's where I'm more familiar. Uh, the uh, Dallas Fort Worth up to Oklahoma City, we'd like to add an additional frequency there. So there's sort of a, mem a memory pattern. So folks have morning and afternoon departures in each direction. So. Uh, and you brought up Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my dream since I was a kid, catching a train in Cleveland Union Terminal, what does it take to get trains back into CUT? It will take further analysis there in Cleveland to see what makes the most sense. So I know it's a dream to go into Cleveland Union Terminal. Uh, there's a lot of uh, approaching infrastructure that needs to be addressed. Uh, we also are in discussions with the city of Cleveland has been a great supporter of ours in this proposal, and they have a lakefront vision plan, uh, which they have asked us to participate in. So uh, we'll also want to make sure that they're part of the conversation on where they think the station makes the most sense. Well, and you know, if you go back to the Burnham plan and and here in Chicago, we worship that Burnham plan. Uh, the Burnham plan did have the main train station on the lakefront, right? Sure. And it was the Van Swergen brothers that put it on the public square. But uh, what a beautiful facility. Let's My goal is to get the reauthorization passed and the funding. Wouldn't that be a problem to have to decide where to put this Cleveland in station? Let's go get the resources first. <laughs> I'll Absolutely. leave it up to the I'll leave it up to the engineers and the uh, locals to decide exactly where it goes. Our job in government affairs is to go get the money and to make the case that this is a good a good expenditure for the public. Uh, absolutely. I agree with that totally. Um, we do have a question here about another issue that's uh, uh, important to me. Uh, trains to O'Hare. Uh, have have you considered getting trains from the Midwest directly into O'Hare Airport? Uh, that is not part of this plan. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> again, <laughs> if, if, <laughs> again this, is, this is really a vision document. It is not the end game. This is really just the beginning. Uh, and if there are local interests in the state or the city of Chicago that uh, see connecting the inner city passenger rail network to O'Hare, uh, as a priority, we will work with them. I will tell you that there are other places on the network, our proposal, we'd like to stop at Cleveland Hopkins Airport. We want to stop at, uh, at the airport there at Detroit, uh, Detroit Wayne. So we do know, again, that uh, this is about building a transportation system. And where we pass airports, we certainly want to have a station stop. Excellent. Um... Uh, there's a question here about yard capacity and other kind of capacity in the Chicago area. Is there enough? What can you do to expand it? 
Uh, we do know that there are yard capacity issues uh, at Chicago, and we are actively working to address it. Uh, because of the nature of how that will be addressed, I would rather not go into any further detail. Excellent. It's a live issue. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, next question down the line, there is an active organization right now to get additional service in the southern part of North Dakota and Montana. Um, and certainly Chicago to Atlanta and uh, to Florida is a big market. What can folks do to help get those into the discussion? Some things like that. Not a very well worded question, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I, I get the question. I'm just trying to figure out, I wanna answer this and uh, you, you never know who's watching these things and it could be my boss. So you have to answer these <laughs> things the right way. <laughs> Hey, well, okay. So again, back to points I've made before. We know that the sweet spot for passenger rail in terms of its ability to compete in the travel marketplace is on trips of 100 to 500 miles. And of course, that distance gets longer the faster the train goes. Uh, we're looking at improving conventional service here. So that's why the 100 to 400 mile uh, limit. Beyond that, the passenger train is less competitive and the services are more expensive to operate. So we would need dramatically, we would need more operating subsidy to operate long distance trains. Uh, I love the long distance trains network just as much as anyone else, but this particular plan is about expanding service that can be competitive and not, and provide revenue and resources to the bottom line of Amtrak. Again, of course, we'll need that capital support, and that's not out of line with what uh, the taxpayers provide to other modes, but we're proposing a system here that will need less long-term operating support. Uh, anything outside of those corridor lengths uh, is just is not as competitive uh, with other modes, and so that's why we've not proposed it. Again, it doesn't mean that other st that the states themselves, if they see a public policy uh, role for passenger rail, we we think those dollars need to exist as uh, that the that they need to be able to go after federal dollars uh, to help with that. Uh, but that's not part of this proposal for that reason. Um, so I guess I will re-answer the question saying we need to get the senators of North Dakota and Montana riled up. Uh, and that's me saying that uh, and say, uh, get them money so that that train can run. Um, in a, we'll run it if, the, if, if, if we're provided with the resources, uh, we will run the train. We will bring our expertise to that. I mean, there's some exciting things coming down the pike on the long distance network in terms of customer amenity improvement. So yeah, bring it on, we'll do it. Well, what about new rolling stock? The, you know, the super liners are old, need replaced. What's the status on, on replacing those? Uh, we are, I think right now, we're sort of doing an analysis on the super liner rolling stock uh especially i think the superliner twos let me step back on that i'll just say we're doing an analysis on the longevity of the superliner rolling stock we have asked for the resources in our reauthorization to uh, begin the process of procuring new equipment to replace the superliners again they're getting long in the tooth uh, so we will do necessary life extension things uh, to keep the equipment safe and comfortable but we've asked for the money to replace it. Um, and again, that's, we've got to get people riled up in, in the, st the Western states to say this needs to happen. So this mm -hmm. is folks communicating with their senators and congressmen saying, I want, I want new trains. I don't want these old antiques. Um, have you looked at all at the uh, pods that they're going to have in Austria on the night trains there? Uh, they're kind of similar to the slumber coaches that were affordable private rooms. I have not. Rick, it's hard enough to stay on top of what's happening in the United States. 
<laughs> I leave that to you to to share with us uh, what you learn <laughs> when you make your international forays. <laughs> I haven't written them yet, just seen pictures, but I'm looking forward to it. All right. Um, I can tell you this, I'll add this. Uh, you know, throughout, of course, throughout the pandemic, uh, ridership has taken quite a significant hit. Uh, but we have been very impressed at Amtrak at the uptake by the consumers in our private rooms. Um, we are uh, really going to be in the process, and there's some exciting things about refocusing on the experience uh, for those customers because people really did respond to the availability of having space for themselves privately to travel, uh, not only just over long distances, but uh, short distances too. So, well, you know, my 21 year old has to come back from college in New Orleans. And uh, I, I think there's a high likelihood he's having a private room uh, for that trip back, for that reason. Thank you for your business. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I know that uh, the, the, was it a VP of long distance trains? I'm not sure his name, but you know, he said that you all were, were surprised at how that ridership was retained, right? Wasn't it true that the long distance trains retained a much, did a much better job of retaining the market during the downturn? They did, you know, um, overall, you know, at our, at our, at the nadir, if I'm saying that word right. I mean, we had ridership drop to, I mean, well over 90% uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, the long distance trains, you know, of course, we're turning around now. Uh, they were holding as much as 40% of their ridership. Uh, and that, again, that just speaks to the essential nature of the transportation that it provides to the communities that it serves. And so we really take that part of our mission seriously as well. So. Excellent. And then let me uh, take a minute here. I, as I said, there are many, many questions. I, I appreciate all of you wanting to be engaged. Um, let me see if I can bring one home. Because you said you you have uh, an engagement right at the top of the hour. I have a hard stop. I have another presentation. And yeah. God forbid I have technical difficulties because, with them too, because I'm not getting on <laughs> early. <laughs> I understand. So um, I just, you know, so we'll wrap it up. I appreciate everybody's questions. Um, I'll, I'll go through these and uh, do our best to get some answers if, if there's ones that we didn't cover. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. Again, if, if uh, we're really in a critical time with the president pushing a really exciting program, I am super excited about Congressman Moulton's proposal and the fact that he constantly points out that there are high-speed trains running between Shanghai and Beijing in four and a half hours today. Um, and that's the distance of Chicago to Atlanta. And to have a visionary like that today out there pushing um, this is exciting. This is a great uh, expansion plan that Amtrak has proposed. Of course, we would like Congress to fund something much bigger and more exciting but we're glad that for the initiative. Um, and I'll also point out there's a critical vote today in California for high-speed rail, not today, today, but this month, um, that uh, is a little on the fence. And so we need to get our uh, folks in California really engaged um, and watch for some email updates on, uh, on that for us, uh, from us in the next uh, couple of weeks. So thank you again, everybody for coming. And, and Derek, thank you very much for, uh, giving this uh, great presentation today. And thank you so much for your organization's advocacy. Uh, we couldn't do what we did without uh, organizations like yours and the public stepping up uh, and voicing your support for rail in the U.S. Thank you. It's our pleasure. And so I think uh, our members are the ones that make it happen. So thank you again. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.